Hi, I'm Konstantin Baum, Master of Wine, and it's time for another battle today. They fought dozens of wars over the centuries, but today it's time to settle the Anglo-French dispute in a slightly unexpected way. In these black bags are two English sparkling wines and two champagnes, and after this blind tasting, I'm going to decide who actually produces the best sparkling wine. Let's go. Champagne is the king of bottle fermented sparkling wine. There, I said it. But there are new contenders to the throne and one has been making the rounds a lot in recent years. Compared to the centuries of tradition in Champagne, English sparkling wine is a fairly recent invention. The new wave, if you want to call it that, of vineyard planting started in the middle of the 20th century. And today there are around about 200 wineries working on 3,700 hectares of vineyards in England. Just for context, that's not a lot. The region of Champagne alone covers 34,200 hectares, so roughly 10 times of what you find in the whole of England. More than half of the vineyards in England were planted over the last 12 years and the formerly widespread workhorse or hybrid grape varieties Solaris, Bacchus and Seval Blanc were widely replaced by Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. The latter three grape varieties are of course also the most widely planted grape varieties in Champagne and also the climate and some of the soils such as Cimmerigian limestone are similar to Champagne. The cool and often wet climate in England is pretty good for the production of sparkling wine but these conditions are also pretty tough if you want to produce wine commercially. You know in 2012 I was actually living in London and I remember really well how the press was describing the terrible growing conditions in the vineyards and how some wineries were not harvesting any grapes due to poor weather. Nevertheless, more and more English producers have started making their own sparkling wine and today we're going to find out whether they can rival or even defeat the king of sparkling wine. So Leon ordered four sparkling wines for me and they are labeled one to five because I couldn't find bag number four. So if you have seen it, please comment down below. I'm going to blind taste them side by side. So let's see whether I can find out which one is which. So let's pour and taste the wines. There we go. So right off the bat there's a huge difference in terms of colors. So this is wine number one, two, three and five or four whatever you want to call it. But as you can see this is like a salmon pink color. This is bright yellow. This is really dark reddish color and this is a little bit more golden in color. Not that this necessarily tells me all that much about the wines, but there are big differences. I would actually say that the color in wine number three is a bit weird. It's It stands out. I mean, this is not the most typical sparkling wine color. It's pretty dark for a sparkling champagne style wine. Flavor wise, they are actually pretty diverse, very interesting. This one, wine number one, has quite a lot of complexity, intensity, and there are flavors of brioche coming through, a little bit of strawberry, a little bit of rhubarb. So yeah, it's quite, quite appealing. Wine number two is much more fresh. It feels like the youngest wine out of the bunch and the one that didn't have a lot of contact with the lees. So it's more lemon zesty, quite fruit driven. There's also brioche char character, but it's not overpowering that's for sure. Wine number three is quite fruity as well but there's there's quite a lot of strawberry there quite a lot of cherry flavor there's also some brioche characters some dough character coming through and wine number four is for me the most classic in a way it feels it smells of lemon zest it smells of those freshly baked brioches it also smells a little bit of ripe apple. Again, nose-wise, I think they perform on a similar level. I think the middle two wines are a bit, well, a bit weird in a way. So this one, due to its color and its dark fruit character, so the intense cherry fruit flavor is not necessarily what I would think of if I would think of a sparkling rosé champagne style wine. And this is, well, a little bit more fruity, a little less serious, I guess. In sparkling wines, in bottle fermented sparkling wines, you definitely want some brioche character and intense brioche flavor is often seen as a sign of quality. And here you don't really have intense brioche flavor. I didn't say anything about the bubbles, but they are fairly similar in all four wines. So they are fine, they are delicate, they are intense. There's quite a lot of bubbliness. Um, 
yeah, there's not much more I can say about the bubbles. On the palette, there are also interesting differences. The first two, Y number one and two, are actually a bit lighter, a bit fresher, quite a lot of acidity, quite a lot of liveliness. Well, wine number three and wine number four, a bit more round and concentrated. There's more concentration there, a little bit more body. So this would suggest to me that wine number three and wine number four are actually from Champagne because if I remember right, then the wines from England tend to be a bit lighter, a bit more of what people say wines from Champagne used to be like 30, 40, 50 years ago before climate change changed those dynamics. But this is not necessarily always a given. The fact that it's difficult to grow grapes in England also means that the yields tend to be fairly low compared to Champagne. So sometimes the wines in England due to lower yields actually have quite a bit of concentration while poor champagne can be a little bit diluted if it's really harvested at very high yields so well it's i'm not 100 percent sure where i'm going to end up with those four wines so this is tricky but i have to make a decision my favorite wines out of the tasting are actually the first and the last i really like the complexity and well, the multitude of layers here in this wine. And I quite like the concentration complexity on the nose, but also on the palate that wine number four shows. The middle two are also really good sparkling wines, but I prefer those two. So I'm going to give wine number one 91 points. I'm going to give wine number four 92 points. I think wine number two is for me an 89 point wine and wine number three is a 90 point wine. But my task was to identify where which wine is from. So let me start. Wine number three is actually a very distinctive style. It could be from England because it's a little bit out of the box, but I actually think I know which wine this is. I think this is the Tétanger Rosé, which is made by using quite a lot of red wine in the blend. So they use Pinot Noir made as a red wine in order to give it this color, this concentration and so on and so forth. So this is my first champagne. Now let's move on to the other Rosé. I think Leon wouldn't have put two Rosé wines from Champagne into this tasting. But I actually think this could be from Champagne. It's really well made. It's a beautiful wine with lots of complexity. But I'm going to say this is from England. So this leaves me with those two wines. And I'm going to start with wine number two. I actually think due to its lightness, its crispness, its freshness and its absence of intense yeast flavors, this is from England. This is obviously a bit of a controversial argument because you could say that in England you can age wine for however however long you want on the lease. But due to its crisp and fresh acidity, I actually think this is from the cooler climate region, i.e. England. And that leaves me with wine number four or five. And I actually think this is from Champagne. It's complex. It's multi-layered. I believe this is a really beautiful sparkling wine from the Champagne region. I don't think it's like a top-notch wine from any of the producers in Champagne. I actually think it's like the Brut, the standard wine of the house, but it's really well made. So let's start off with wine number three, the one where I said this is not just Champagne, Rosé Champagne, but it's Tétanger Rosé Champagne. Let's see. That's it. Tétanger. To be honest, this is a bit of a party trick. This wine is very distinctive in its style, so it's not that difficult to identify it if you have tasted it before. So let's move on to wine number one, which I said is an English sparkling wine rosé, and it is an English sparkling wine rosé. So this is the Coates and Seeley. And I believe that Christian Seeley, the person who is in charge of lots of famous estates in the wine world, is involved in this product. It's called Méthode Britannique, whatever that actually means. And it's a rosé wine from Hampshire in England. So the wine is a blend of Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So there's no Chardonnay involved here. 
And I think it's really well made. It's beautifully complex and quite complete. So a pretty nice wine. So let's move on to wine number two, the one where I said this is from England, a sparkling wine from England, a well-made sparkling wine, but more of a fruit-driven style. <coughs> so this is Paul Roger Champagne. I actually thought this was from England. I mean, I thought it was a good wine, but not like an outstanding sparkling wine. And this is actually one of the more famous estates in Champagne. In my defense, this wine is actually the official supplier to the queen or the king nowadays. So there's a strong connection, you know, between England and this wine. But I was wrong. So this means this wine is likely the English sparkling wine. And let's see what it is. I'm really curious now. English sparkling wine from Knee Timber. I believe it's called Knee Timber, and this is one of the most well-known producers in England. They're really kind of famous for producing beautiful sparkling wines. And to be honest, this wine was the one that impressed me the most in this tasting. So going back and forth between those wines, I actually have to say I'm very impressed by the English sparkling wines in this tasting. This was a fascinating tasting. If you think now that you can make a big bargain by buying English sparkling wine as opposed to champagne, that's not necessarily the case. The Night Timber and the Paul Roger are roughly at the same price, so around 45, 50 US dollars, while the Coates and Sealy costs around 50 US dollars and the Titanger Rosé around 70, 80 US dollars. So they are, all roughly in the same price category so not necessarily something you can make a big bargain on but it's definitely something worth discovering so the question in the beginning was can english sparkling wine dethrone champagne and in this tasting they definitely did two beautiful wines that performed really well they were not worlds apart with the champagnes but i think they showed better than the champagnes and they were more to my palate this is an indication of where English sparkling wine could be heading and I'm certainly going to try more of these wines in order to kind of yeah stay in the loop. But I'm not going to stop drinking champagne, that's for sure. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video then please like it down here, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. My question of the day is, have you tasted English sparkling wine? Let me know what you think of those wines down below. I hope I see you guys again soon. Until then, Stay thirsty.